That being 7 o'clock, we'll call the Marathon County Board of Supervisors to order, please. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing. Following the Pledge of Allegiance will be a silent moment of reflection. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will have the reading of the notice, please. An educational meeting of the Marathon County Board of Supervisors will be held at the Marathon County Courthouse Assembly Room, 500 Forest Street in the city of Wausau at 7 p.m. on March 16th, and the agenda was duly signed and posted. Thank you. I would like to request everyone please silence their cell phones or put them on vibrate as to not be an interruption to the meeting, and I thank you for your compliance. We will move on to roll call and sign in. Please, everyone, sign in. Uh, Supervisor Hardinger, I know you're on WebEx. Can you, if you're connected to uh, open meetings, could you please sign in? Thank you. And thank you. We will proceed. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of the visitors that we have here with us this evening, along with the uh, uh, along with the viewing audience. Uh, and uh, thank you for your interest in Marathon County government. We will move on to item number seven, that's public comment. Uh, and uh, we have one individual that has signed up, uh, and it is Guy Ferdell, and he wanted to speak about the strategic plan. Good evening, Chairman Gibbs and members of the County Board. It's not on? Oh, okay. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Gibbs and members of the County Board. I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm Guy Friedel. I live at 2240 Ruby Drive, Cronowetter. At the January 2023 20, meeting of the Executive Committee, I explained that the number of standards for new interstate access had been reduced by the federal government from eight down to two. There was some question about that, so I went on the internet tonight and I printed off a copy of the, of the new standards. And to, I knew this was some time ago, but it was actually adopted in May of 2017, almost six years ago. Now, it had to wind its way through the Wisconsin DOT, but the Wisconsin DOT also adopted these standards, and I think it was because of Cronenwetter's interest in the Kowalski Road interchange. So the most important standard of the two standards is whether or not a new interchange will promote the, will negatively impact in a substantial way the operational safety of the interchange system. Frankly, anyone who has used the ramps at the Quask Road interchange knows that, that two of those ramps are not safe. They're not good. And it would actually improve the safety of the interstate to relieve some of the traffic off of the Cedar Creek interchange. And as Cronenwetter grows, there's going to be more and more traffic. We just completed, finally, after a four-year effort, a floodplain map amendment that opens up a large portion of what we call the Old 51 Corridor for commercial development. We are, Cronenwetter is also spending millions of dollars to build a water treatment plant and to improve its sanitary sewer system. So the village is planning for the future. Twelve hundred jobs in twenty years. Do the math. That's sixty jobs a year. That's sixty families a year. Cronowetter by itself can and will provide the housing 
for those 60 new jobs. We wouldn't be spending millions of dollars on a new treatment plant and to improve our sewer system to sit on our hands and not continue to expand and grow our tax base. The executive committee talked about the feasibility of the Kwaski Road interchange as being a reason for not doing it or to not support it. The feasibility of the Kwaski Road interchange is a matter to be determined by the application for the interchange justification access report. It's not to be determined by Marathon County. It's to be determined by the Wisconsin DOT and the Federal Highway Administration. So in my opinion, using feasibility as a reason not to support the Kwaski Road interchange, especially when it wouldn't cost Marathon County a penny and would in fact bring 1,200 or more good paying jobs to Marathon County and would give Marathon County the benefit of over a hundred million dollars in new tax base, which according to my math is going to generate 400,000 a year for Marathon County in county taxes. So I think Marathon County is shooting itself in the foot here. We didn't ask Marathon County for a penny, not one penny for the Kowalski Road interchange. All we asked was for the concept. Uh, Supervisor Baker had asked me to come here tonight. I'm happy to do so. And I know that he has some thoughts on why the Kowalski Road Interchange is important to providing the housing needs of Marathon County. If you look at where growth has occurred, there's a lot of growth that has occurred not only in Cronenwetter, but in Mosney, in Rothschild, and in Weston. The county, in my opinion, is hurting itself if it's not supporting that growth. Our residents have said that they need to get up to Wassa Had it for a while. to go to Aspirus in order, and they've got to be there in 15 minutes. If they've got to wind their way through the Cedar Creek interchange, they're not going to get there. But if we had a Kowalski Road interchange, they could get right on the interstate and go, and they would be there in that 15 minutes. That they say is important. So I thank you for your time, and those are the thoughts that I wanted to share with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on. Uh, that is all the individuals that had signed up for public comment uh, on items that pertain to the agenda tonight. Uh, next, we have educational presentation reports, information uh, update regarding the resettlement of the Afghan ref refugees in central Wisconsin. And we have with us today uh, the director of the Multicultural Community Center, Adam Van Nord. Adam? Please. Everybody, thank you, um, Chairman Gibbs. Uh, could Ryan. could I put you on hold for just a second? Do we have te uh, do we have tech support? Yeah. We have tech support for uh, the system here. System here. System here. Test. test, test. Can the people on WebEx hear me? Yep. Oh. Thank you. Hi. Right. Hi, right, please. I'm sorry, Matt, uh, Adam. Please. No, no problem. Again, thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. I know uh, for many of you, the um, Activities that our, the Refugee Resettlement Agency is conducting in Marathon County and in central Wisconsin is something new. Um, many of you may have been aware that uh, sometime over, a little over a year ago, we opened up a new office that began with the resettlement of Afghan refugees coming to the United States in the wake of the fall of Afghanistan. Um, but just one correction is that we, we no longer resettle just Afghans. It is, it is an international and global effort, and we're seeing populations come from all over the world, which you'll see here on my slide presentation. 
So before I just give you a little update on what we've been up to and some of the progress that we're seeing, uh, I would like to provide some background for those of you who are unfamiliar with what we are doing. Uh, as I said, we are a resettlement agency, one of 10 now uh, nationally that are part of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. It is a... Um, it is one of many legal pathways that immigrants have to come to our nation, uh, but it is by far the most grueling and time intensive. Uh, most refugees that are coming to the United States through this pathway uh, have been in process between one and three years before they are able to make it to American soil. And uh, immigrants coming through this process are among the most vetted, just to make that clarification. I know, um, you know, in today's world, there's a lot of talk about immigration and pros and cons and challenges, and we just want to make sure that uh, we don't lump it all into one uh, ball of wax. Of course, you know, things happening at the southern border uh, is one aspect of, of migration trends, and we're involved in another aspect. So just to make that clear, there are also many different types of immigrants. Some come seeking asylum, uh, some come through the refugee process, some have short-term visas, others are undocumented. So it's important to keep all of that in mind as well. Uh, we're with the Ethiopian Community Development Council. Again, this is one of 10 national uh, volunteer organizations, nonprofits that subcontract with the federal government uh, to do the work that we do. And we are in Wausau, Wisconsin after a pretty lengthy um, community assessment that took place with co cooperation from our national uh, community members in uh, Marathon County, as well as involvement from the state. And following that assessment, it was decided that uh, we should go ahead and proceed with the opening of our office. So it was indeed a collaborative process. Um, our mission, in short, is to open up viable pathways for refugees and immigrants. Uh, primarily at this point, we are focusing on refugees specifically. And so these are individuals who are fleeing persecution in their country of origin and are unable to return to their home countries for fear of persecution uh, or physical harm due to their religion, uh, their political uh, status, or membership in different social groups. Uh, we have two categories of services. Uh, Self-sufficiency is one aim, and then longer term, we're looking at how we can assist individuals in fully integrating in the community and becoming part of this community in me meaningful ways. Our programs and services include our initial uh, support that we, that we supply and provide to incoming refugees for three months, that first 90 days. Uh, which includes things like setting them up with their, with their home, uh, enrollment in different public benefits that they may qualify for, helping them with you know, health care and education, getting their kids enrolled in schools, etc. And then following that, we have longer term supportive programs that can ensure that their connection, again, with the community and, and um, other groups and supportive community-based organizations uh, can continue. And that's uh, included in as far as our job search and employment services. Um, we provide just different, different ways of helping them overcome transportation barriers in the community, uh, ways for them to get into their own personal vehicles, for example, um, different things like that. We're working right now with, with about between 15 and 20 uh, employers in the county. Uh, to make sure that our refugees are able to get jobs as quickly as possible and stand on their own two feet, uh, which again is one of our main goals. So in the community integration services, we provide intensive case management for some cases where there are high barriers. So we do have some individuals coming uh, who may have complex medical needs uh, or perhaps children with developmental uh, disabilities, so we can provide uh, extra support for, for those types of cases as well. And then with our Afghan population, we provide what are called gap services. So again, after they've been here for a few months and are set up in their, their homes and are you know, uh, connected with employment, we can step in in, in different ways that, that are needed um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, that's just to help uh, those individuals that are struggling in different ways. Um, and we also are supporting Ukrainian individuals in a similar way right now who are here on short-term parole while the war in Ukraine continues to go on. So 
where we're at in terms of numbers this year, um, you can see in the column on the left, we've received 10 refugees between January and March of this year, bringing us to a full year total, uh, fiscal year total, rather, uh, 45 arrivals between October of 2022 and March of 2023. Um, and in addition, we have received eight Ukrainians and four Cubans who've come into the area, all of which are eligible for the services that we offer in our agency. And looking ahead, we're expecting that number to continue to climb. Um, on average, we'll probably see between 15 and 20 uh, refugee arrivals through September of 2023, which is the final month of our fiscal year. And we are also supporting a few cases that are attempting to reunify over in Barron County. Uh, so that's in the northwest part of the state where some Somali refugees came many years ago and are still looking to get uh, reunited with family members. So kind of stepping back and looking at uh, the numbers as a whole across all of the communities that we serve. Again, we're in Wausau, but also Stevens Point and Marshfield. Um, to date, since we opened our doors, we have around 129 uh, refugees who have come through this process and have chosen to stay in central Wisconsin. We've resettled actually closer to 200, but you know, some people after they've had a chance to get settled here, they pursue, um, you know, re reuniting with family members or friends in other states around, uh, the country. And so we call that out migration. And so a number of, of individuals have chosen to leave the area. Uh, following their initial resettlement period. But you can see on the graph here of how that, that number breaks down in terms of you know, children and adults and by gender. Um, on average, the case size is about three individuals and um, you can see that depicted there uh, across 41 cases that we've supported so far. So in terms of households, um, we do have one, one household over in Eau Claire that we're continuing uh, to track and support. Uh, again, the couple of cases in Barron and then coming closer to home, we have uh, two in Marshfield, uh, eight households in Stevens Point, and then 21 households in Wausau here in Marathon County. So in terms of uh, <clears throat> Individual clients, again, looking at Wausau, we have 72 individuals, uh, and in Stevens Point, 36, 14 in Marshfield, three in Barron, and then that one in Eau Claire. In terms of the ethnicity, as I said, when we opened our doors uh, just over a year ago, our initial focus was on Afghans, so you can see that here. Uh, we are continuing to support and um, be involved with about 68 Afghans, but our second largest population is now Congolese. Uh, you'll see 48 individuals in that, uh, with that ethnic background, and nine Burundian um, th and three Somali. And then we have one from Sudan, that's that small uh, yellow piece of the, the chart. Um, we do expect going forward to serve probably half our case from Central Africa. So that would be people coming uh, out of the longstanding war and ethnic violence that we've seen in countries like Rwanda um, and um, Burundi itself. And so we will continue to see people who've been in refugee camps now for a couple decades due to that violence, finally having the opportunity to uh, arrive in the United States. And then looking at uh, some of the outcomes, again, one of our biggest focuses is self-sufficiency for these individuals. Um, out of the 41 households that, we, uh, that I mentioned, 41 cases, 32 have achieved full-time employment, seven part-time, and uh, we have a couple of indi individuals who are earning income through self-employment activities. Some of the highlights from this uh, you know, recent quarter um, we're, we are seeing individuals doing really well here overall. Um, those who don't have a reason to, to move to join family members in other states are finding Wausau and central Wisconsin to be a welcoming community. Uh, they want to stay. 
they're forming connections within their ethnic groups, which is important for them to have, um, you know, just a familiar uh, culture to connect with, um, but also with the broader community as well. We're seeing individuals that are getting plugged in through, um, you know, different uh, civic organizations and things like, you know, Boys and Girls Club for children and youth. Um, also through faith communities, we're seeing individuals, um, you know, start to put down roots in that way. This is just a, a, an image of our Congolese population down in Point. Um, we have between 20 and 30 Congolese uh, individuals in that area, and they have uh, began to connect um, and form their own social uh, organizations and are kind of on their own now looking at ways that they can support their own, which is what we want to see. Um, another highlight has been continued uh, stakeholder engagement with diverse partners in the area. One of the things that is very important to us is strong collaboration, you know, working closely with the school district, with healthcare providers, um, with nonprofits in the region, and really looking at what we can do to um, not reinvent the wheel. Uh, we don't want to create, you know, specific programs for refugees. We'd rather have our existing service providers build capacity and improve culturally relevant, linguistically competent services wherever that's possible. And that's what we're seeing. So we're really proud of that. Um, and then, like I said, the employment opportunities so far in, in the region remain plentiful. I think we're still hovering around three, you know, two to three percent unemployment. So from the employer perspective, um, people are just really eager to get connected with our agency and improve those onboarding pathways into um, some of our manufacturing jobs and, and other industries that we have here in the region. And then lastly, like I said, uh, newcomers are continuing to stabilize. They're increasing in mobility. They're getting their own driver's licenses, personal vehicles. And you know, just at one year in, that's something that we're really uh, is a promising sign for us um, as we just look at the outcomes that we're, we're seeing. Uh, some of the challenges, again, are those high barrier cases. Um, they tend to, uh, to really put a lot of uh, strain on our staff resources as well as some of the volunteer groups that we have recruited uh, who are assisting new families. Uh, safe affordable housing inventory continues to be somewhat of a challenge. However, to date we have not had to put anyone in hotels or in you know transitional living situations for longer than a few days. So we have been able to find apartments and homes for everyone. And then that sticky transportation, which I know has been an issue in our, uh, in Wausau specifically for, for some time now. Um, and then lastly, continuing to strengthen private resources. We, you know, about 60 to 70% of what we do can be uh, reliably, you know, done with uh, federal grants and state grants that we have access to, but we are continuing to look at um, various local funders to really step in and take some ownership on a local level of, of this effort. Um, lastly, I just want to again thank, uh, thank you for the time to even be here. This is really important for us to engage the community. Um, we know that some, uh, some look on what we're doing with keen interest and enthusiasm and others with maybe some mild skepticism or concern and that's perfectly reasonable and we are more than happy to have conversation with with anybody who uh, wants to learn more about what we're doing or better understand our approach so our door is always open and my email inbox is always open for questions and we're happy to be a part of efforts like this that are available uh, to share about what we're doing. So I will open it up uh, for as long as we have um, for any questions that uh, the group might want to ask. Any questions for Alan? Supervisor Krause. Thank you. I have a question about um, <clears throat> their children going to school. How are they, um, how do they integrate into the schools and how are they acclimated? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I will say all of the students that we have seen so far um, enroll in our schools, and that includes Marshfield and Stevens Point as well, um, have been mainstreamed, which was which is for us a great 
um, opportunity for the students to, um, you know, learn social um, norms here in America, to, to learn culture, and also grow in their language ability. Um, one of the challenges that we're seeing in Wausau is we have limited ELL support. And so we're actually looking at some new models that might be deployed in the next school year um, to implement what are called newcomer centers, where it's sort of the best of both worlds, where instead of subjects like ELL, which would be, or excuse me, um, English language arts, which might be too much for a newcomer that's learning a new language, they, they would move them into more uh, English language support classes and then mainstream students in things like um, art or gym class or, you know, uh, math, things that don't require as strong as a, a language base. And so we're excited about that possibility. And what it would do is allow um, the Wassa School District to concentrate different staff members in a few buildings rather than trying to accommodate uh, refugee groups in every building where they might um, go just based on their, their address. So uh, we're, we're confident that they're going to be able to move through some of their growing pains. But overall, uh, we've had tremendously positive feedback from, from WASA. And our students are the fastest uh, language learners among you know, the, the whole incoming population. They, there are young people who came with no English uh, early in 2022 who you can have complete full conversations now with in English. So it's amazing how fast they can pick that up. Okay, Supervisor Shafinsky. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, it gives a nice uh, window into what you're doing. And I'd like to build on, on Supervisor Crowley's questions. And, and the first question is, uh, of the adult population, what percentage of that population comes with any English language skills? Yeah, great question. Within the Afghan population, it was probably 60% had English language, um, you know, maybe basic on up to, you know, full proficiency. In the newer populations we're receiving from Central Africa, the number is a lot less. And so we are, you know, noticing that trend. Again, we, we don't like to generalize too much, but based on the, the cases we've resettled so far, that does seem to be the case. And then to follow up on that, uh, you, you have in your slide community integration. And of course, the only way you're going to become integrated in the community is if you speak the common language, English. Exactly. So what, what uh, structures, what programs do you have in place to help facilitate the adult English language uh, learning process. Yeah, thank you for your question. So thankfully, uh, North Central Technical College and Mid-State Technical College both offer free um, English language classes from beginner on up to level six, where they're working on you know writing and, and you know uh, advanced language tasks. So um, we have great access to high quality programming. One of the challenges with that is when people come and get a job, that employment then becomes a, a hindrance to ongoing language, right? Because courses are typically offered Monday through Friday during the daytime. Uh, so we've augmented that with uh, volunteer-based ELL, which for now in Wausau is happening at First United Methodist Church with a growing group of English language volunteers. And they're able to pick up a lot of these odd times that we need to uh, you know, schedule in order to fit the work schedules of our of our families and individuals and similar down in point we have portage county literacy council doing the same thing so it is a huge focus for us and we to your point we fully recognize that if you don't go deep with language you will not you know you're going to remain socially isolated and that's not what we want to have happened so we are investing a lot of time and energy into making classes available for for everyone supervisor marash Thank you, Chair. I have several questions. Um, so piggybacking off of the language learning English, do you have interpreters or when they have appointments and whatnot? We do, yeah. And so we, we initially relied heavily on an electronic uh, video-based interpretation service, which 
is very good uh, on demand, uh, but also very expensive. But now that we've had people come and resettle, we we have a growing you know population of individuals who are able to serve as in-person interpreters, which typically is a better experience. Um, and so we actually contract with them and it works out because it's cheaper for us to go that route, but also allows them a way to earn income as well. So we do have languages that are um, harder to find interpretation for, um, but primarily we're, our, our main language groups are Dari Pashto, which is for our Afghans, and then Swahili is a regional language that serves most of our African um, arrivals. So. And then you mentioned gap services. Could you give a few examples of that, please? Yeah. So, for example, if someone is struggling to obtain a driver's license, we can step in and offer tutoring um, or just more one on one support to help get them through that written test. Um, if they lose a job and they're in transition, they may need um, a month of emergency rent. And so we have private resources we can dip into for that. Um, medical is another one where um, navigating our health system is challenging for someone in English sometimes, let alone through language barriers or through literacy barriers. So we have health navigators that can step in and help them set up appointments or access those appointments. So those are some examples, but really it's anything really that they run up against a wall, a vital need that they may have. The, our door is open for them to come to us and we can work out a solution through our case management staff. And then the last one, I know they just got here and they're getting acclimated and getting jobs and everything, but do you foresee them working towards citizenship in the future? That is very common. I think this, I may, have to check this, but I think over three quarters of refugees uh, eventually will apply for citizenship. They can't apply for five years. Um, so after they get their green card, they have to, you know, wait a number of years. They have to become proficient in English because the test that you have to take to become a citizen is in English. And so, you know, it's a it's a long journey, but most want to become citizens. Um, but it does take some time. Yeah, but they are as a they are legal permanent residents as a refugee. Um, after one year, it's sort of a formality, but they do have to apply for an adjustment of status. Uh, then they receive a green card, and then they're you know they can they're here to work. They have all the rights as we do, um, with the exception of you know things like voting until they actually become citizens. Thank you, Supervisor Cavelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Adam, for the presentation. Um, can you give us an idea of, of what it costs to facilitate the 21 households in Marathon County? Um, on a per capita basis is probably the best I can do. So every individual who comes through this through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program receives $1,275 per person, but it's a one-time grant. Um, and we we really tightly manage those funds at our agency to make sure it goes to those things that they really need, like housing. So just to put it into perspective, um, if a family of three comes and they have, you know, a, a boy and a girl, we have to provide by housing regulations and our own requirements uh, at least a two bedroom home because uh, they have to be gender segregated bedrooms. And so that uh, roughly, you know, $3,800 or so uh, is pretty much gone in two months, you know, when you pay a security deposit, first month's rent. And so that's why, you know, we need, we need to develop that private funding um, so that if there are extra needs, we have the ability to support where needed. Um, a case of one, for example, a single person, even if you rent a studio for 500 bucks, that money is pretty much spoken for in their first month. So it just shows you how, how critical it is for them to get into an, employ, an employment situation as fast as possible. Uh, thank you, and a follow-up question. Um, you, you talked about you haven't really ran into an issue with finding affordable housing. Uh, you know, we've heard presentations on the board here about the lack of affordable housing for the area. Uh, so I, I was just wondering how you got across that barrier to find the affordable housing? Well, it's a, a lot of work, don't get me wrong. We have we have a, um, one individual who's that's their whole job is just to watch uh, at 
uh, apartments and homes coming onto the market. We do have limited ability to hold places with landlords, and but we'd ha we had to do a lot of outreach as well to, um, you know, um, get landlords accustomed to the idea even of renting to people who don't have a credit score, who don't have a job. And um, over the last year, I think we've been successful in forming those, those partnerships. So when a new person gets added to our agency, so we know they're coming in a few, you know, three, four weeks out, um, right away we have a pretty strong network of landlords that we can, we can reach out to and say, hey, what, do you have anything coming available? So some of the strategies that we've put in place, I think, have helped. But it is still a challenge, and it's stressful. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, I think with that, that was our last question that we had. So uh, Adam, I want to thank you for a great presentation and thank you for the work that you do for supporting the refugees in Marathon County. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Gibbs. And we'll move on then to uh, education presentation reports by standing committee chairs or designees. So uh, Vice Chair McEwen. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick update on our um, March 9th Infrastructure Committee meeting that we had. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jim Griesbach, the Highway Commissioner, um, advised the committee that he's attempting to purchase um, some uh, personal safety lighting for the highway workers um, <clears throat> that they can wear on their, their uniforms. Um, it's, a, it's a safety issue. Uh, it's, they look like little lights on a squad car, except they're not blue, but they're, they're red and green. Uh, and it makes them <clears throat> very much more visible. Um, and uh, the, it, it says a budget, budget transfer. The total, <clears throat> excuse me, the total cost is around $10,000 for all these um, lights. Um, and he's attempting to find that in his budget, but in case he was not able to do that, uh, we gave him a, a tentative uh, uh, approval to uh, take it out of the highway reserve. Um, there was also a discussion on weight limit requests <clears throat> to, for County Highway H um, from 1.5 miles south of Highway 29 uh, to County Highway N um, from Kingdom Haven Farms. And it's a safety issue, so their vehicles uh, getting on 20, you know, getting on 29 would have a ramp uh, to get on and make it a lot more safe uh, for those vehicles. Uh, that was approved. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, uh, Jim Kriesbach uh, informed us about the summer uh, roadside vegetation plan, basically to keep the weeds down and, and uh, shrubs down along the roadway, the process that they um, used to do that. Uh, we had an update from the um, from Jackie or Debbie, yeah Debbie Debbie Jackson from uh, the T TDA, which is the Transportation Development Association. The update <clears throat> was basically on new revenue resources um, that's available um, to counties, um, and just a couple of them um, as far as generating uh, tax money and revenue uh, from. Uh, taxes on uh, electric vehicles um, and annual and annual tax on auto parts um, which can all be used for um, highways the we had, we had a update from supervisor Robinson on the broadband um, and uh, <clears throat> then we had a bid opening for asphalt pulverizing um, and mine and milling um, the costs are up about 5% compared to last year. Um, Highway Safety Commission meeting, uh, we received an update from Kevin Lang on what uh, transpired at that meeting. Um, and that was about it. Uh, anybody have any questions? Any questions for the Vice Chairman? Okay, we'll move Thank on. You. Any other uh, reports by committee chairs or designees? Okay, we will move on to review and discussion of Tuesday meeting agenda items. Under item 9A, we have appointments. Under 9A1, we have the North Central Community Services Program Board. Appointing Jeremy Hunt of Weston to the North Central Community Services Program Board 
for a three-year term to expire December 31st, 2025, replacing Dr. Gabriel Tico. Any questions on that appointment? Okay, we will move on to item 9A2, Board of Adjustment appointment. Appointing Patrick Schreiner of Athens to the Marathon County Board of Adjustment to complete a term to expire June 30, 2024, replacing Karen Peel. Any discussion on that appointment? All right, we will move on to ordinances under 9B. 9B1 is the creation of a Marathon County Energy Task Force. Ordinance 0-7-23. Any discussion? And we have um, Supervisor Lemmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would bet many people in this room haven't heard about the task force um, or had a formal presentation. So allow me to give some history and um, perspective. Um, in sometime this summer, the Lemmer family experienced a huge increase in our utility bills. And so we did some things to mitigate those. For instance, we took our water heater temperature and changed that. We changed the thermostat program so that in the summertime our heat was, I mean our air conditioning was not going to kick in as early and in the winter time it was going to go, <clears throat> take a little longer for it to heat up. We looked at some water uh, things we could do. We looked at some lights. So when I came to a um, HRFP meeting and I expressed some disappointment to Supervisor Robinson that as we're working on the strategic plan, there wasn't a energy goal. And he said, don't be disappointed. You are one of 38 members. You can come up with a strategy and an outcome measure. So I decided to go home and do a little research. But I, maybe in my um, newness of being a supervisor, had a really hard time nailing down what exactly needed to happen. So I came back to the HRFP the following meeting and um, we had some discussion and just decided maybe it needs to be studied. I'm a teacher, I used to teach how to study, and so we always start with questions. So what are the questions we have? Well, for me, what are we already doing? Many people I asked gave some vague answers, but there was a lot of, well, we do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I also wondered um, what's realistic because uh, what are we, if we're already doing something and it's not working, so what would the next step be? I looked at other counties. Other counties in the state are doing things like looking at their fleets, looking at how much uh, fuel they purchase countywide, um, looking at things that would impact. And when you Google, which is what I did, how do you save money in county you know, facilities? <laughs> you get the conservation things like we did at the Lemmer family home, and then you also get some of the renewables and all of the other things. So there's just a whole lot that, to me, we need to look at. We need to look at it systematically. We need to look at it thoughtfully. We need to look at it with the lens of how is this going to impact our county facilities, and is it going to make the taxpayer, like me, um, benefit. So I'm asking for us to consider uh, an energy task force. When I think about what we did at the Lemmer family, our house is, you know, a couple of thousand square feet maybe, but the county owns tens of thousands of square feet of, they, they use way more water than the Lemmer family does. They have way more f fleets of vehicles than the Lemmer family has. So I think um, when we look at the costs, they have gone up. And if you go to page 15 and 16 in the budget book that we were given in um, November, uh, Administrator Leonard writes about the um, unexpected natural gas increase we had. So we uh, spent 400, over $400,000 with ARPA money to plug that gap. I don't know about you, but I would much rather put that $400,000 towards something with an investment return, not just something that's going out of a chimney or out a tailpipe. Um, and if you read page 16, the projections are energy costs will continue. And so 
a possibility that was listed there was we could maybe sell the social services building to cover the costs of this year's, which to me is kind of short-sighted. I think we need long-term solutions for this. And again, that's going to take some study. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, City Pages article uh, last week, but there is a fragile grid system that we have um, in December. We Energies asked its customers to drop their thermostats down to 60 or 62 degrees because the natural gas um, pipeline that they were using to supply their customers had a um, mechanical issue and they were concerned that they would not be able to service their customers without customers taking that um, step for um, that short amount of time. So again, I think this has merit. Um, we also have an opportunity that we have not had before with the federal and state monies coming from either the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act. We can now realize some direct pay instead of um, not qualifying for those. So it could make some of these projects pencil be um, by um, alleviating some of the burden that we would have to put forth. You can't apply for those monies without a plan in place. So I think we need to get seated around a table and um, make a plan. So who should come to the table? Well, I would invite everybody in this body to come um, to the table because there's institutional knowledge here. I have some classroom experience and I do know how to research, but this is a little bigger than Mrs. Lemmer's brain. So I would love to have um, lots of people. And if you look at the uh, charter that's um, posted there, there's many, many of you who, who could come. Um, what would we do? Well, we would determine our current um, energy usage staff. We would rely on staff for that um, with the goal of reducing that burden um, on, on the tax levy and pursue all available resources that are outside um, of funding. Um, once we get that baseline, uh, identify where are the opportunities for our county facilities. Take a really holistic look, at maybe looking at the largest um, consumers. Um, identify those costs and those benefits and then deciding if it pencils um, because if it has too long of an ROI or a return on investment then why do it? it the goal here is to um, save money um, and and make sure we're fiscally focused with it and then of course we'd have to identify any partners that might help us and um, get a report with recommendations for um, this body to consider it's a tight timeline. If you look at the timeline, it's basically we have a year to to work. Um, so I will happily entertain as many questions as I can, and I would like to um, invite some of my colleagues to assist me in answering questions if I'm unable to do so. Okay, so Supervisor Shafinsky is next. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Supervisor Lemmer. Uh, I appreciate your efforts in, in this regard. Uh, and, and actually, I agree with a lot of, you know, your problem statement. I do, I do have concerns, and I philosophically disagree with the concept of creating another task force. And the reason why I say that is we have a standing infrastructure committee and structure and I would, to me, the first response of any government organization is, and not even just government, a lot of organizations. It's a bureaucratic thing. Let's create another task force. Let's create another committee to address the issue. We have people in place within the county that infrastructure, that's their job. I would say that the appropriate thing to do would be to assign the, uh, the timeline, and, and your plan is, is very well thought out. It's very aggressive. Uh, I, would, I would say we give that direction uh, to Administrator Leonard and to staff and say, okay, these are good marching orders. Go make it happen. Uh, why, why create yet another organization? And I'll ask uh, both Supervisor Lemmer and uh, 
perhaps Chairman Gibbs and Mr. Pruner, you know, is there some legal reason why we would need to create a task force and have this ordinance as opposed to handling it within the existing structure of, of uh, Marathon County? Sure. Um, since you asked a legal question, I'll try to give you a legal answer. Um, I would say that the specific terms uh, of the energy task force ordinance are not found anywhere else in our existing code. Um, that wouldn't prevent the county board from assigning responsibilities such as that to, to a, an existing standing committee. So. Um, I don't think there's a legal requirement to to create the task force. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Supervisor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one of the reasons why we looked at the creating a task force is that this has been talked about at the Human Resources, Finance, and Property Committee for three years, and we just don't have the time um, to dedicate to it in light of budgetary, human resource, and other issues. And I think that's one of the concerns of, of putting it on or imposing it on a committee. It, it is broad ranging. You know, you have, you have parks um, uh, that have lighting issues, vehicle issues. You have uh, conservation zoning planning with a fleet. You have other departments and other committees that are all impacted by this. Uh, Discussion and the, the reason of having the task force is that it's focused um, on on any issue or a topic, um, and it's time uh, sensitive, which means that they're more likely to get through it in a timely manner and, and bring all of those viewpoints together and and develop those policies. Uh, I laud uh, Supervisor Lemmer for her tenacity in in trying to do this, but you know you think about what you've seen from WCA recently. WCA's invited all of us to participate in something relative to electric vehicle electric vehicle charging stations. Um, next week the the um, HR Finance Property Committee will be dealing with the community development block grant on energy use. Uh, there are great opportunities that present themselves relative to the bipartisan infrastructure law that were never there before, that 30% tax credit. We talked earlier this year about how we use the gas at the landfill uh, and what benefit that might have to the county and what value it might have economically to the, to the taxpayers of the state. And there are many opportunities, and when you bring that one group together and focus on it, you tend to get exactly that focus. Uh, and it's not lost in the... Um, the operational details and in, in po operational policy details of a standing committee, and it brings the breadth of the county uh, through um, allowing members of other committees to bring that committee's perspective. Uh, there are so many different areas of, of county government that contribute to our energy u utilization um, and therefore could benefit from policies and practices, whether it's the buildings, whether it's boilers, whether it's vehicles, um, or, or other policies. I think it's important to have that focus. Vice Chair McEwen. Oops. Oh, okay, he withdrew. Supervisor Krause. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm concerned about a couple things here, and uh, one is that it's not open to everybody on the board that you selected certain committees from which only those people can be on the energy task force, and I think that's that's not very good. It's not inclusive. It's exclusive. Um, for example, some of the committees that haven't been allowed to um, have people uh, attend and, and be a member of this energy task force are people on the Public Safety Committee, people on the Health and Human Services Committee, people on the Social Services Committee, people on the Transportation Committee. Now all of those deal with some form of energy and energy use. And I'm thinking, why are they being excluded? Why can't individuals who want to be on this task force come forward and give their in intelligence and their research and their interest in this topic? And the, uh, my other issue is um, that energy, the use of energy and, and uh, renewable energy, I know of a particular family, they were my landlords, 20, 
three years ago where they had in their home, it was an old farmhouse and it was in Marathon County, and they put in thermal enter the thermal uh, floor. So the heat was radiating up from their floor and the heat came from water. And this is an old farmhouse, how they, how they did it. I don't know the particulars because I'm not into that kind of thing. But, uh, and then my, uh, so there's many different kinds of ways that we could use renewable energy and cut our natural and, cu and cut our costs. And the other thing is, is any new buildings going up could have some form of alternative energy. On, on Thomas Street area where I live, they put up a lot, they widened the streets, made it really nice for transportation, which is pretty heavy now. But they put up a, a lot of new um, duplexes, townhouses, things like that, and they have solar roofs. People are saying, well, you can't have solar in Wisconsin. We don't have enough sunshine. But these roofs have them and other locations have them. So I don't know if the idea is to remodel some of the buildings that the county has or make this just a procedure that any new buildings coming up would have some form of alternative energy, which definitely cuts costs because alternative, alternative energy now is much cheaper than the regular forms of energy. Thank you. Hey, Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, last month this came to executive committee and I had some questions about kind of the policy uh, framework, the charter framework and such. And so then it moved back to HR finance and then it came back to exec um, and still had some questions. And I still have some questions now uh, regarding kind of the policy structure of it to bring up. One is um, once there's a policy that's recommended or created out of the final report, who is going to be making the decision on that? Is that going to be the reporting committee, which is HR finance, or is that all of that policy and all of those decisions going to come back to the county board? Second question would be with the new budget timeline, uh, item G3 uh, in this charter talks about October 31st, 2023, uh, having some recommendations for the CIP. However, that is a month after we already have a budget, and so I'm one, when the budget is, is presented to HR Finance and to the full board is September 26th. Um, so when we get to October 31st, we're almost at the point of public hearing, and so I'm wondering how that timeline uh, ties into that. And the third thing is this is not in the strategic plan. There was discussion at exec about that. The strategic plan you have in front of you does not list this particular item in it. Um, and it also therefore is not in the work plan for the administrator. So uh, is that going to be something that is going to be introduced to be into the strategic plan? Um, because if it's not, then I, I see us doing work that isn't something that the board approved because the work plan is something the board approves. So those three questions, could I have those answered? Does, who, who wants to address those? Supervisor Lemmer? I can try. Um, it's Supervisor my Robinson? Oh. Uh, Supervisor Lemmer first, please. It's my understanding the count, this would all be coming back to the county board for um, whatever happens. <laughs> so not the HRFP. Um, as far as the 31st, I'll defer to somebody else to kind of go through that timeline um, because I asked for advice on how to create that and um, some of that was created outside of my purview. But the um, comp plan has it has this as a goal. The strategic plan, it's loose, but it fits under 12.3 with cost-effective services. And our HRFP in August 23rd, we put it on the HRFP's work plan. It's even noted on page 16 in the budget book where it talks about this being, and I can quote, um, the HR Finance and Property Committee has expressed its interest to develop policies guiding property divestment and to refine our existing energy conservation policies. So it's been in our HRFP plan. Um, maybe not the administrator's plan, but since he's part of that, I would assume it matches up. 
And I, I guess I would reiterate that the uh, plan would come, or whatever uh, report is being made comes back to this full board for uh, discussion. And so the board has its purview over for the full implementation of any and all of the recommendations that are coming from a, a, any task force. A task force has no ability to implement any, uh, any policies. They are recommending, as with any standing committee, recommending uh, potential uh, operations to the board. Um, and uh, so, uh, I, uh, again, it would be uh, coming back to the full board. As far as the budget item, um, I believe uh, that it was set that way because that is the last that the CIP could be changed uh, before the budget gets adopted. If their re recommendations um, uh, are uh, CIP worthy uh, and uh, you know, may or may not, uh, depend on where the funding source would come from. So, okay. Any other discussion? I did have another set of questions. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, so philosophically, getting outside of the the policy part of it, um, you know, Supervisor Lemmer said, you know. They did this on their own. I guess I question why we can't be doing these cuts on our own, these decisions of light bulbs or water usage or temperature. Um, I don't think it takes necessarily rocket scientists to figure that out. Um, so that's kind of the one, the one part of it is this cost savings. The second part of it, and this is kind of the philosophical argument that I'm, I'm having issue with, and, um, and that is it's not just about cutting costs, but it is about renewable energy. It is about this idea of how do we do these other things. It is about casting the net wide, which is a comment that was made at the executive committee. Um, so this isn't just about cutting $400,000. Um, I would say philosophically, if it's about, philosophically, if it's about cutting $400,000, we had amendments to the budget uh, that never got heard where we could have cut $400,000. Um, so we can we can figure out other ways to cut four hundred thousand um, dollars. I think generally, as I stated to to uh, Supervisor Lemmer and to the Executive Committee and others, I think yes, cutting costs is a good thing. Um, but I don't know if we need the Energy Task Force to do that. It seems to me the Energy Task Force has this greater case of looking at renewable energy and looking at these other uh, processes uh, to to implement for our county uh, government. Um, so that is a concern for me with the task force. And I would say it's also a concern because we have people in the room um, who didn't make public comment tonight because it wasn't an agendized item, um, discussed who have con very strong concerns about wind systems uh, in the western part of our county, which is renewable energy. And part of that is discussion is the tax uh, the revenue that can be generated within our county, uh, but it also affects our property values. So if we're going to open ourselves up, this energy task force, to things like renewable energy, I do think we should be having the discussion with our citizens in parts of our county about what's happening. Uh, we were alerted at a, at a Towns Association meeting in October with some information about uh, this particular project, but it wasn't really made um, as if there was anything we can do or any kind of concern we should have about it. Um, but I did find out about this uh, recently, and I know there were some board members, including yourself, Mr. Chair, a Tuesday night who were there at Country Air in Stratford uh, listening to uh, the 400 or so people who were in there who were having a concern with this. So um, if we're talking about renewable energy and the energy task force, I just think that uh, if we do go forward with this, I think it would behoove that that committee to look at all of the uh, pros and cons. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Shervinsky. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a couple things, and, and one is I think that we need to be very clear on what, what the intended mandate is or purview would be. As Supervisor Lemmer described it, it's... It's conservation, it's how to reduce the energy cost, the energy footprint of the county's buildings. That's a very laudable goal. 
Um, I agree with the plan. I think she's a, uh, her and the, the group that worked on this, I think they've come up with a very aggressive but doable plan. That's, that's the way you get results. I would uh, disagree on the methodology and would like to see that handled under infrastructure. We assign that to staff and say, this is one of your goals for the year. Go get it done. Uh, but the, the broader philosophical questions that Supervisor Dickinson brought up is, you know, uh, regarding the possibility of promoting or encouraging, uh, quote unquote, renewable energy. Uh, I will caution all of the supervisors, particularly the, the non-technical, non-engineering oriented supervisors. Renewable is a very, very, very slippery term and you really have to dig into the numbers, hardcore numbers, hardcore engineering and look at whether or not you're really achieving the goals that you want. You can make all you can make great cases on both sides of wind turbines, for an example. Is it really green or is it not? You know, it's something that you really have to dig deep into. It's not quite as simple as it might appear. The other philosophical question that I have is, and I'll ask uh, Supervisor Lamarand or Supervisor Robinson, perhaps. Uh, I take it the way that this is worded, the scope is county buildings only. And I would like some, okay, I'm seeing nodding of heads, some uh, assurance that this is not the first step and second step is then, well, let's impose something on the public. So thank you. Next, we have Supervisor Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can answer that other question in just the county board's ability. We don't have any say over anything else except for the buildings and the vehicles in our fleet. Um, we don't have the control to tell people to put renewable energy. We can't force wind turbines to be built or not built. We don't have that ability. The state has not provided us with that. Um, the other part of all of this, and I'm hearing this in the discussion, is that we have two paths here. We have we, and some supervisors are kind of saying the same thing at the same time. We either have committees go alone and push certain policies within their jurisdictions, or we create a task force in which all of these committees come together and the task force would have public input because they'd have to be public input. We would, everyone for every meeting would have a public comment. I'm not sure if that's actually the, what happens at every task force, but there would be public comment because it would be a public meeting. So, you know, the property and finance committee, we have jurisdiction to set policy or guide policy for every building in the county. But we decided that it was probably the best thing for everybody on the county board to have some sort of input on doing this and moving forward. The funny thing is if, if we're concerned about this being a push for renewable, in, uh, renewable resources and building that, then this is literally the way to either speak against that or the pros or cons. This literally is asking for a number of supervisors to get involved and have a say in this. Um, it's, it's not a way, it, if this was a sneaky way to sneak renewable resources into this, um, this is a very loud way of doing that by having public comment, by having a task force in which everyone is involved. So. Like I said, we can either go it alone, we can have individual committees, you know, ask for policy changes, or we could go it together and have a task force in which everyone has a say. Thank you. Supervisor Sandalski. Yeah, I just had a little um, more to go on that. Uh, I, I think there might be a wider agenda behind this all, but uh, the, all these people that came here and uh, um, all the visitors and that are a lot of them came because of the wind the wind turbines that they're trying to push upon the rural areas which is it's really bad because it's uh for the health for the property values and i mean on and on you can i've been watching videos on this all this stuff 
And I feel like this kind of is a waste of time for the county. I mean, you might save a little bit of money overall, I mean, do, going through all this stuff, but I think there's a wider agenda trying to be, be placed here. Um, I, w I would like to see a committee, if we're going on committees, uh, to protect the rights of the the landowners and the farmers and, and that within a county. I know it's it, maybe it's not uh, the right place to talk about, but it's it's honestly what, because that's why a lot of these people are here in the community and the people I, I represent are in the rural area and uh, <clears throat> I gotta say they, uh, they're really, really, really frustrated with what's going on with this uh, wind farm stuff. So I'm not really in favor of this, uh, this new task force. Thank you. Supervisor Krause. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I hear that people are interested in the cost, but there is another important issue beyond that, and that is human safety, the safety of the employees uh, in Marathon County here in the buildings that they work in, the people in the jails. Uh, climate change is here. We can't ignore it. We have downed trees, houses, flooding, slippery ice everywhere, rain in January. How can anyone deny climate change? Then, for example, we had to spend lots of money on the jail. Why? Because we had so much snowfall, it wrecked the roof, it cracked the walls in the jail, some of the jail doors couldn't open. We had serious problems, that was a big issue. Then at North Central Healthcare, they had to put in some different kinds of uh, solar heating or whatever heating, thermal heating pipes and air conditioning because, because of climate change and because of the new structure of that building, that cost a lot more. So we're, ta we're not just talking costs here, we're talking safety of people. And um, look what happened with um, a lot of other places in this country, in, in Wisconsin. Look what's happening on the East Coast. Look what's happening on the West Coast. We're, as government leaders, we should be leading the forefront. Supervisor on, Crowley, on please, I'm just going to remind you that we're talking about the task force and we're not talking about the, the environment in. Yes, uh, I don't so please see. Keep your comments. Thank you. Uh, I don't see too to much mentioned force. in this on climate change and uh, how that's affecting our buildings and our people. Thank you. Okay, we've got Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My only comment is going to be, um, I would hope that we would not look at this as one committee has the power to decide policy but is going to allow other people at their discretion that the full board um, has some input and can make some comment. Um, I think the power is our 38 supervisors as a county board. But it reiterates the question I had initially, which is what policy will be made and who will be deciding the policy when the final report is delivered? If HR Finance is going to be the committee that is uh, res the responsible committee for this task force, then I have grave concern based upon the comment we just heard that the committee will not be uh, fully in, uh, uh, fully looking at the county board input for it, that they feel, and, and, and perhaps it is um, under our code, that they can then uh, guide the policy within the county government. That's my concern. So I would be, if we're going to go ahead and give the charter to the task force, then the full county board should have a say in that, not HR finance. Thank you. Our bylaws require that a task force has a reporting committee, but ultimately the full board will receive the report and, and accept or deny the report and its potential recommendations. And so that's how this will happen is the full board will get it, but our bylaws require that a task force has a reporting committee. And so that's why the reporting committee is in there 
and ultimately it does come to the full board and it's the full board's decision on, on moving forward. Um, Supervisor Lemmer is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really don't want somebody to misrepresent me. I am not here with an agenda. I sympathize with anybody who feels they are being taken advantage of with some wind turbines. I don't know anything about that. That is not my project. I have nothing to do with it. I want to be responsible. I ran on fiscally res being fiscal responsible, responsible, and I am a taxpayer, and so I would expect one of the jobs that I should be doing, and I want you all to do this too, is to be responsible with our funds. And I would rather pay $400,000 to Elsa with childcare than up a chimney or out a tailpipe. I have no agenda other than what can we do long term because energy is costing us more money than we're budgeting for. So please come to the table then if you fear <laughs> for the direction we're going and help lead the group and drive the direction. One of the other concerns that I heard from the, the supervisors was that uh, it is limiting as to who can participate. If you read the charter, the charter says recommendations from these committees, but it's open to five supervisors, so uh, I would be the appointing authority. I would be open to anybody that has interest in serving, uh, uh, again, but limited to the five uh, individuals that the, the charter spells out. Uh, Supervisor Hart is next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to clarify my comments. Um, everything that almost every committee does has to be approved through the full board. That's, you know, we, tonight we have a list of ordinances that we'll be talking about. All of them got approved by a certain committee, but every single one of them has to be approved by the full board. So in saying that the finance committee would be going alone and setting policy, we, we don't have that ability. But it, when it comes to um, this energy task force, we would rather get the input from every committee um, in a open dialogue than having the finance committee do this on our own because I think as Chair Robinson said, we don't have the ability to do this on our own with the number of things that we have to do. We, we're the only committee that has to meet twice a month just based off of our um, workload. So um, that's, a, I think, another case to recommend the support of this because we do have to set these policies and we should do it collaboratively. Um, and send that to the full board, just as everything else. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other discussion? Supervisor Wilhelm. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with this being with the buildings, vehicles, wouldn't that fall under more under infrastructure? You know, like you would report to the infrastructure committee having this instead of the, because if the finance committee has a lot on their plate, um, it was just something I was thinking about because it's probably going to affect, I don't know if it, which area would affect the most, if it's buildings or grounds or, you know, we're looking at cost savings. Um, I don't, is, has the cost savings ever been brought up with, I don't, um, like for example, thermometers, the time setting thermometers, things like that. Is that already done here or is that just something like when you, you put your thermometers on a set schedule for when people aren't here, when they are here, and things like that for saving energy. But I was just, I, I, when I heard your discussion, I thought it would fall under infrastructure and the committee could report to them. They're not putting the extra onto the finance committee. We're also property. Okay. okay. Yeah. So infrastructure is, in, is responsible for the um, highways, uh, the uh, also for uh, IT, but uh, HR finance is responsible for facilities uh, under uh, under our own rules that this board adopted. Um, so that's why uh, the the suggestion is is there. One of the things that um, uh, you know when we when we talk about the potential of having a task force look. Um, one of the challenges and the struggles that I have when, uh, when we have uh, individuals say, we, well, just have somebody else do it, 
the, the challenge happens to come about uh, is whenever you implement something that requires resources uh, and uh, it requires the allocation of resources. Now, one of the things that we currently do is obviously on any uh, remodels and any on a new construction, that is clearly a mandate that the that facilities and maintenance does and that is look at every possible energy efficiency that they can implement in new facilities but i'll give this board just a prime example of where i saw opportunity uh, and yet we chose as a board historically not to look at where there was opportunities for tax save or for taxpayer savings in operational costs and that is uh, the facilities at North Central Healthcare. As everyone knows on this board, I tr uh, serve as the chair of the North Central Healthcare uh, Community Services Program Board. We have down there, uh, the facilities is going through a major renovation. One of those renovations is the replacement of the heating system that was in place down there that was in place for over 50 years boilers that were probably uh, somewhere around 50 to 60 percent efficient. We chose, because it was brought to the CIP committee when I served on a CIP, uh, the uh, potential about replacing them with some 90s plus some efficiency boilers. We chose not to do that uh, as a committee and not recommend doing it because it meant that we would have had to go borrow money. We have opportunities right now with potential use of ARPA funding that potentially could be used if that were the case on outside facilities. And then we have a effective return on investment on those kind of uh, things. We don't take those on right now currently uh, simply because it would require additional resource allocation. And again, we have uh, a potential opportunity to utilizing some ARPA if we want to look at some of those uh, things. But I think what the task force does is it brings all uh, who choose to uh, potentially uh, opt to be participants in this have a uh, and from various committees and the viewpoints of all of the board trying to get all the board in writing simply a report the report be is then brought to this board it is not for implementation until this board says it's for implementation so um, I, 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 I understand that some people have this perception that this is uh, something to uh, to have mandates for renewable energy and uh, I just struggle with that perception. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? Okay, we will move on to item 9B2, increase of a medical examiner's fees as permitted by state law, ordinance 0-8-23. Any discussion? Okay, we go to item 9B3 from the Town of Eau Plaine Rezone, J. Trevor, Ordinance 0-9-23. Any questions? Moving on to item 9B4 from the Town of Marathon Rezone, Chris Fieri and Edward and Roseanne Buchberger, Ordinance 0-10-23. Any questions on that rezone? Okay, we'll move on to resolutions under item C. Under item C, 9C1, Environmental Resources Committee under 9C1A, an approval of the Town of Mosley Local Zordinance, Zoning Ordinance Amendment, Resolution 12-23. Any discussion? OK, 
Okay, we go on to item 9C, 1B, a resolution to support for salt pollution prevention, the ICER application certification, and the ICER application liability protection. Resolution 13-23. Any discussion? Supervisor Dickinson. So just to make sure that I understand, so this legislation, legislation that we would be supporting uh, creates a deicer certification program in the DNR that's voluntary. If someone chooses it and they use the methods within that plan, then when they put down uh, their brine and someone gets hurt, they'll have limited liability. Is that correct? That's my understanding as well. Okay. So um, if someone doesn't, then they get no additional protections. That's also my understanding. Right. Um, but it also um, would, if we went through it, say our county highway department, it would subject us to any, uh, any change of that program, which would be controlled by the state, by the DNR, to follow the approved methods that they say. Would that hold us to to that, that if we don't use those approved me methods, we wouldn't get the protection? So it, my understanding of the bill is that it applies to private uh, private companies or private individuals who are uh, applying de-icer, uh, but it wouldn't apply to the county. So I, I don't think it would uh, directly affect us in that way, um, but I don't know for sure. And then just the last kind of comment. So it, it seems that it's, it's probably fair to say that the program could be changed as, as to what methods are being used, say the changing the, the brine solution where it's even less salt, that whoever uses that would kind of have to still follow those methods. Do we have any thought on that? Or, or is it you get grandfathered into what it was when you chose it or do we? I'm just trying to get a feel for it because what I don't want to do is I don't want to go forward with a, supporting it when we're in essence kind of giving people, putting people under control of the state DNR. And that part I don't have any answer to. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm sure I could consult with our CPZ staff and bring something back on Tuesday. Any other discussion? Supervisor Shafinsky. Thank you, Chair Gibbs. So looking at all this, and, and first of all, just to make very clear, I'm 100% behind the concept of using less salt. We use entirely too much salt, uh, and over the last 20, 30 years, our salt usage just has skyrocketed compared to what it used to be. But having said that, uh, my understanding of this this uh, bill that's now currently in the Senate, in the state legislature, is really about liability. And our resolution in, in support of it is really, it's not going to change the amount of salt usage by one pound or one ounce within the state and within the county. Uh, it's, it's all nothing more or less than a feel good pat on the back, look what, we, look what we did to try and help reduce the amount of salt that's used and, and also have the potential liability protection for a private company. And that's really not something that Marathon County or the state really needs to be involved in. You know, if uh, we look at, at company XYZ and they hire a, uh, a landscaping company that does snow removal and ice removal in the winter, that's between those companies. And if there's an issue with the snow or salt removal and or something happens, there's some type of an incident, there are, there are many different legal ways of, of dealing with that issue right now. So I guess I don't see the point in us supporting what, what essentially is a feel good process. We have with us uh, on the WebEx, we have uh, uh, 
Lori Miss Kimmins is the CPC director and Jeff Pritchard with us. Um, and I would invite them if they wish to uh, give the perspective of, of uh, the, the discussion at least that happened at CPC uh, when this resolution came forward. Can you hear me? Now I can. Mr. Oh, Pritchard, please you. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in response to uh, some of the questions that were presented by uh, supervisors, this will not have any impact on the highway department functions. Uh, they are directed by the Department of Transportation in terms of suggested de-icing and winter uh, maintenance efforts for our county roads and other roadways. Uh, in terms of salt usage, this has been a uh, multi-year uh, discussion with the Stormwater Coalition. Uh, we have partnered with SaltWise, and uh, we have held a lot of um, uh, workshops throughout the region uh, in terms of mm -hmm demonstrating how cities, villages, and in fact counties, and including schools, uh, should calibrate their equipment because oftentimes they've been using excess salt and didn't even realize it. Um, and I can very soundly say that the salt usage has been cut in over the years by implementing some of these programs. Now this particular resolution of support uh, is uh, as a volunteer program to assist private sector uh, for individuals that want, uh, have private companies and work for other entities for de-icing and winter maintenance efforts. So it helps protect them and what has tended to be the case is that over salting has been the, has been the scenario for uh, years, if you will, because they are scared of someone being hurt. I can give a firsthand uh, uh, account in that uh, Mayo Clinic has incorporated this type of process, and they have reduced their salt usage by 50 percent, and they have maintain public safety in terms of sidewalks and parking lots and entryways, and they have not had any incidences that were different uh, or, or liability cases have been increased because of someone falling as a result. <coughs> Lori, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Lori might still be on mute. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I would, I would, uh, um, you know, reiterate at least uh, uh, what Corp Council says as it, as it's understood right now, it does not apply to the highway department, but the the uh, comment. I think the the, uh, the highway department uh, gave us a presentation about a year and a half ago on the utilization of the brine solution and how they have implemented brine uh, rather than salt. And they have said and, and, have, and have shown the amount of salt that they utilize has decreased significantly uh, on the county roads. Uh, we have next Supervisor Cavelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one question, is there a cost to be a certified applicator? I don't know the answer. We'll try to we'll try to get an answer for you for Tuesday. Thank you. Any other discussion? S Supervisor Langenhan, please. Supervisor Langenhan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Now I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing. I was looking up my notes here, and I realized that this is in the resolution. 
uh, in the uh, fourth, whereas it says Marathon County recognizes that best management practices such as brining can significantly reduce chloride pollution by potentially up to 50% as compared to direct salt application. Uh, you know, for those private organizations, uh, really something like this is going to give them some cushion in implementing those best management practices, which if we can have less salt, potentially, that's always going to be a good thing. Um, I, I certainly would uh, appreciate if staff could give a little bit more background with the questions that were asked with uh, the, the cost. Um, and uh, it may be even appropriate if we could find the bill language and include that for uh, Tuesday's meeting as well to have some further uh, information. But really, at the end of the day, why I support this out of the committee is, is that there could be potentially a positive economic impact uh, if there's this cushion in place so that private uh, organizations can implement uh, these practices. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other discussion? And we'll try to get those answers that, for those questions that were posed uh, for uh, next Tuesday's meeting and try to include the bill language in the packet. Uh, next, we have uh, from Human New Resources Finance and Property Committee, Health and Human Services Committee, item 9C2A, approve the 2023 budget transfer from Marathon County Department of Appropriations, resolution uh, R-14-23, also known as the Dream Up Grant. Any discussion? Supervisor Marshall. Supervisor Marshall, you might still be on mute. hear me now now I can hear you go ahead please thank you all right um, the the person that is receiving the grant child care Inc um, serves many counties will this um, 75,000 be uh, concentrated on uh, positions in Marathon County the administrator I think uh, may have some in insight uh, thank you mr. chair um, great question, Supervisor Marshall. On page 77 of the packet information, there's a just a table that summarizes where those funds are being allocated, and you are absolutely correct in that all of the funds would be targeted to Marathon County. Again, essentially this is a dis distribution of grant funds where Marathon County is, uh, for lack of a better term, serving as the fiscal agent. We were the lead grant applicant of a number of entities within Marathon County that partnered in uh, seeking those grant funds from the state of Wisconsin. That team then developed the distribution uh, plan as was required by the grant, and all of the grant funds are required to be disseminated within the grant territory, and that grant territory was Marathon County. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Supervisor Shafinsky. So this is a, a grant program. Is is the intention that this is a one-time, one-year program, or is there some intention that this would be a pilot and thereby kind of generating a life of its own? Administrator Leonard, please. The, the grant was a one-time allocation of $75,000 in terms of funding. Uh, there was a second component of that, which was technical assistance, and that has... Um, already been completed, the technical assistance provided by the state of Wisconsin. So it's um, absent the state of Wisconsin essentially recreating the grant and Marathon County reapplying. The grant will uh, be terminated by the uh, grant end date when the funds need to be dispersed. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll move on to item 9C3, Executive Committee and Human Resources Finance and Property Committee. Item 9C3A, an adoption of a timeline for the 2024 budget process, resolution 15-23. Supervisor Robinson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at the end of the last budget process, we heard a number of supervisors with concerns relative to 
um, their opportunity to provide input into the process. So we took those concerns to heart and um, working with Supervisor Hart, developed a um, updated timeline. We wanted to share that with you um, in terms of how we will approach the uh, 2024 county county budget. And these are guides, and while there are dates in there, um, there's, there's some wiggle room, and some of that will be dependent upon perhaps when we get information from the state. Uh, it's a state budget year, and there are a number of things that can impact us. But the capital improvement process will be pretty straightforward, uh, starting in May 1st, and then having a uh, proposed uh, plan by August 22nd. Ultimately, the final uh, capital improvement plan will be incorporated into the 2024 budget when we when we uh, look at how we will allocate our resources to pay for it, whether it is um, reserves, borrowing, or, or other sources. But I wanted to focus primarily on the operating budget process. Uh, we are proposing basically a, a, a commit county board meeting of the whole um, th that will talk about the budget process, budgeting 101. Um, and talk about what mandatory and discretionary programs are and the confusion. Not all funding sources are equal, but we'll talk about what those funding sources are and uh, we'll overview our budget priorities and current assumptions. What are we looking at for increases in health care, uh, compensation, and, and other things. And we also want to review the committee's jurisdiction on program um, modifications and recommendations, something that the administrator um, strove to have committees weigh in last year by going to the committee meetings and asking for input. And I think a lot of people were still new to the process and didn't understand the, the potential uh, for having that input early. But uh, we're proposing to do that in, in April, and the, um, and the chair will talk a little bit um, later about the timing of those um, of that committee of the whole. But, but it will take some time to go over. more energy uh. <laughs> it will take more time to go over that just to familiarize everybody with our with how the county's finances work um, and then once we um, once we have that meeting the committees will uh, consider program modifications and recommendations um, at their committee meetings in in May and then the um, the finance committee will develop a some recommendations on the budget priorities, and you see the, the start of those budget priorities in as an attachment to this. That, that's not necessarily the complete list at this time, but we will present that to the county board for your review and approval um, in, in uh, May. Uh, the administration will then take those and begin to work with the department heads on developing um, using those to drive the development of the budget. New position requests are due on June 1st. Um, that will be one of the priorities that we will be um, asked to identify. Um, then we'll start the, the um, HR Finance Property Committee will work on budget assumptions in July and bring those to you so you understand what those assumptions are. Again, what are we anticipating in terms of growth of revenue? What are we in Participate in, in growth of some of our fixed costs and, and other things, and how might those uh, affect it so that we can be um, uh, more deliberate in our in our discussions. And then um, those uh, assumptions were built into the budgets that go back to the departments. Um, the administrator and the finance director will work with those to develop a recommended uh, uh, budget. And the difference this year, or proposal, is that the county administrator will present his budget to um, the committee as well as the board at the same time at the September 26th meeting, uh, so that we're all hearing the budget at the same time. Uh, from that point, the, the finance committee will then uh, begin meetings, whether it's one meeting or several. We have uh, an October 11th date, which we need to um, set the numbers for publication under state statutes. Uh, we'll look at that. We ask that if you have um, amendments based upon your initial review that you provide those to the committee uh, by October 6th so that we can consider those before the 11th. Uh, the, the budget will then go to a public hearing on November 2nd. Um, 
We're asking again that, that um, any proposed amendments be prepared by November 6th so they can be evaluated. The Finance Committee will meet on or about November 8th to review those and present those to the County Board on November 9th. It's a tight schedule. Uh, some of that's driven by state statutes and when we need to approve our, our budget. Um, there's a, a, some wiggle room in there, but we want to do our, articulate that there are roles for standing committees to look at priorities, assumptions, and make recommendations relative to um, items within their, their um, jurisdiction to both the administration and to, the, to uh, others to have those incorporated into the budget. Um, but we're, uh, hopefully this will allow for a better understanding of that process and, and, when, and when and how you can be involved. And, uh, you know, if we were to adopt this, the, uh, the recommendation for the Committee of the Whole uh, would, uh, we're looking at potentially uh, two, uh, two additional meetings. Uh, those meetings would be uh, next month, uh, it, as the timeline spells out. They would be, and the, for your consideration, they would be a meeting on uh, April 20th, the regular uh, educational meeting. So in, it, we would start the Committee of the Whole and the Budget uh, Presentation and ed Education process at 4.30. Uh, we would uh, go for a maximum of two hours. We would have a half hour break before the education meeting on the 20th that evening. And then we would reconvene again uh, to provide additional education uh, on the 25th, the following Tuesday, uh, of, uh, at, again at 4.30. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, that being the le least intrusive on people's schedules. Hopefully that was uh, available. Uh, people have already tentatively blocked off those dates, the 20th and the 25th, so we're not trying to impose on another date on uh, uh, individuals, but we are um, looking at uh, asking people to consider at least uh, moving uh, to a 4.30 meeting to have everything be presented to the full board at the same time and so they hear the same thing and all the questions that are asked by the by the board are answered by the by the committee or the the presenter at the same time so everyone hears the same thing um, so uh, that's uh, for discussion supervisor Shafinsky is next for discussion thank you chairman and thank you uh, supervisor Robinson uh, looking over all of this information I think that it represents a considerable change, and I think a lot of it's very good. Um, it, it gives a lot more definition to the process, and and being one of the newbies, uh, the first go around was quite overwhelming, and I think this lays it out quite nicely. Uh, the one thing that I do have a concern with is that we always cycle back to we are a policy setting board, and it seems to me that our budget process has been a bottom-up process, which, and, and what I mean by that is the various uh, departments, the various organizations, everybody looks and says, what do we think we need to do? And that's, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that except it's a little bit of a process where everybody's looking to expand their piece of the pie. And then, of course, what you get is the ever-growing pie, the ever-growing budget, the ever-growing tax levy. Uh, from a policy perspective as a board, and maybe this is in here in April, and I'm not understanding that, but it would seem to me that we should have a process whereby the board, as a committee of the whole, sets policy, and I'm not trying to define, I'm going to just throw out some numbers, but uh, just for example, that, that we as a board set policy, and the policy is, for example, uh, the budget increase shall be no more than 3%. The tax levy shall be no more than 2%, or whatever number that you think is appropriate. You, know, you can insert the number. but then that way we are providing guidance to the administrator and to staff that says here's the here's what you have to you know the scope of what you have to live within and and 
you know, we're p applying some control and some breaks to, to the spending process. So uh, Supervisor Robinson, I guess I'll ask you or whoever is appropriate, is that part of the intention of April or was that not really considered? I'll have Supervisor Hart next, and then I'll allow Supervisor Robinson to respond to that question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am a new supervisor, too, obviously, so I was part of developing this as a new supervisor going into this process for the first time. Um, to answer your question, yes, actually, if you look at the timeline, the third item um, in the May kind of category is county board considers and adopts budget priorities. So how that's kind of intended is all of the standing committees would get together and talk about um, their jurisdictions and then come up with um, uh, the, the budget priorities. And then we would take all of that um, and then the full board would look to set a budget priority um, and that was kind of meant to give more information to uh, to administrator Leonard on the forefront of this entire process in order to set up uh, to set a budget that you know over the course of all of this we weren't going to look at and go well we want to throw a bunch of things out or we want to add a bunch of things and this was meant to kind of prevent that from happening up at the beginning and if you have anything else to add Mr. Brother Robinson, please. While that's possible, um, I would encourage you to listen to the Budget 101 because not all dollars are equal. For instance, if we get $40 million of highway projects in one year funded through the federal government and state government, do we want to limit ourselves to no more than a 3% budget increase? I think those are discussions that we can have, but I think some of that will be, some of that discussion will be enlightened by the, the presentations, and we certainly can get into those types of discussions at a priority level, but um, I would ask that we wait to have that presentation. Thank you. Very, very, uh, very thoughtful. The, just the other thing that, uh, you know, is, is, you know, critical in developing this year's, uh, the next year's budget is the state uh, and the adoption of its budget. Uh, because currently, uh, as the governor has developed his budget, there are significant changes to potential uh, shared revenue. There's potential changes to significant, um, you know, uh, funding sources that will affect county uh, county dollars, tax dollars. So, um, and we probably will not see that budget. Uh, or, uh, you know, final adoption until sometime in June uh, because the fiscal year starts July 1. Um, so that's also part of the part of the discussion. Um, next is Supervisor Baker. Thank you, Chair Gibbs. Start off with, I want to thank the HR Finance Committee and specifically Supervisor Hart and Committee Chair Robinson for the work that they put in to the budget timeline proposal and for their effort to make the budget more accessible to each of our supervisors. I have attended some of the HR finance meetings, watched others, and I've come up with a few suggested modifications to the budget timeline for the board's consideration. I think it could potentially improve the process and cause less pain and headaches. So I've emailed the modifications to each of you, um, and it might be helpful if if Chair Gibbs is willing to put that up on the screen and to add that to the packet. So the first modification includes all the topics in the proposed budget summit, but instead of having them in the budget summit, they would be at our standing committees and regular board meetings. And again, this is for discussion. I'm not adamant about this, but Supervisor Hart at the March 8th HR finance meeting said that we should expect the budget sum summit to be painful long and we should all expect to have headaches at the end. So I'm, you know, I think it's at least worth considering other approaches. So if you look at my proposal, instead of having the four hours of, and I thought it was six, but the many hours of the budget summit, some of those items would be moved to HR finance and presented just once. That would be the budget 101. And the um, funding sources, actually just the budget 101. 
and and I understand that there are some you know advantages of doing that to the whole to the whole um, board and having that discussion. So I'm again I'm not adamant about that, but then the discretionary program overview and the review of the committee jurisdiction would be those are specific to standing committees and i'm proposing that we would do those at the standing committees in april and then the supervisors could request information on the programs specific to their standing committees and that would be supervisors that were on the standing committee or other supervisors that were interested and then in may that information that was requested the staff could present that information from the april request and supervisors again in April could request more information, and that would be and that would be um, presented in June, and that would just give the supervisors a little bit more opportunity to to get information. We seem to have a lack of information um, last year, and maybe that was because we didn't ask. But I'm asking now. So then, uh, on the second page, basically. Oh, back on the first page, I did change that the um, budget priorities would be a discussion of budget priorities as opposed to an overview of budget priorities because I don't think those are set yet, so I think that should be a discussion. And then also in May that the standing committees would recommend the budget priorities that wouldn't come just from HR Finance. And I'm going to paraphrase Supervisor Robinson something he told me last HR finance meeting about housing and childcare, and I think it applies even more for budgets. So I think this is an issue I would hope all committees on the county board would be engaged in. There's no right answers, no perfect answers. There are a lot of ideas. The more ideas that we can look at and evaluate, put forth, and do our due diligence, we'll be all better off. So I think that applies equally to budgets. I think that all of the standing committees should be recommending the budget priorities, not just HR finance. So then on to the, to the second page. I didn't have any changes on the first half of the page. And again, I, I want to emphasize that I, I liked a lot of this. I mean, I really appreciate the, that the HR finance did this. So I have a little bit of concern about the amendments to the proposed budget, the Friday, October 6th. And I'm, so I changed that to optional only amendments that could be possibly included in HR finance budget proposal. If you switch to the other chart that I sent out, in 2023, there were 19 budgets or 19 amendments that were proposed. And can you go to the second page of that? I should have had it backward. So 19 budget amendments were considered by HR Finance on 11-9-22. One amendment was recommended, and that came from Finance Director Palmer and Committee Chair Robinson. 14 amendments were not recommended. Two amendments were withdrawn, and two amendments, no action was taken. So there was not a single amendment that was adopted or recommended by the HR Finance, with the exception of the one that came from HR Finance. If you go back up to the first page, I have three graphs that show three of the amendments that passed during the budget process. And the left bar graph shows a balance of the board. So all of the board except HR Finance. The right graph shows HR Finance. So you can see that the makeup of HR Finance does not in any way closely represent the full board in terms of fiscal outlook or fiscal, re in terms of voting on amendments, I guess, let's say that. So we go back to the other, to the other page. That's essentially why I'm, you know, I'm concerned about submitting amendments to the HR finance and then having HR finance determine whether those are gonna be in the budget proposal if those are not, what are the options for those amendments to make it into the, to a vote? And then um, I also changed, or you know, I didn't change anything, but recommended for change, recommended for consideration, 
the second to the last item. So instead of having those amendments come to HR Finance, I think we should consider having a separate educational meeting on this November 7th, where we could go over the budget amendments. That educational meeting would just be for budget amendments. And we could cover those and then not have one long meeting, but have an educational meeting and a meeting, for the normal meeting for adoption of the budget. So thank you for your consideration. Other discussion? Supervisor Hart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment on Supervisor Baker's amendments. I, I'd have to reread the first part. Um, one of the things I learned in this entire process is this is very complicated because the process for setting a budget for a county is kind of set out in state law. Um, we have the ability to make the changes in the forefront. The back part gets very complicated because there are certain, um, it's like, I don't know, maybe the administrator can speak more eloquently about this, but it's essentially you propose a budget which triggers it being published, which triggers it being having a public hearing, and then by state statute, it has to go to the finance committee for potential amendments and then go to the full board. That part I did remember. I'll defer to Corp Council on a lot of it. I mean, you have designated your HR Finance and Property Committee to have the responsibilities ready to re relative to receiving the budget from the administrator. Once I turn the budget over and it's received by the receiving committee, which in this case is the HR Finance and Property Committee, that committee has jurisdiction over the budget, and I am simply here to give you as much information as I can uh, to help you make the best informed decision you can. Uh, relative to the timing set forth by statute, there are a couple of dates, and I thank you to Corp Council for putting those into the resolution itself that talk about <laughs> the date by which the ultimate budget in the state of Wisconsin for each county has to be adopted because that is a very important um, action that Kim then utilizes for uh, apportionment purposes, and that takes some time uh, once the budget is adopted for the apportionment process to carry out. And I believe my recollection, and I don't have the resolution up, but I believe it's November 15th, is that apportionment must, uh, I'm seeing heads nod, so my recollection must be accurate. Um, it takes a couple of days to really get that that process underway. Um, so I, I hope that kind of addresses your point, I mean, your, your questions. HR Finance, by your rules, is designated as that receiving committee. And you are unable, once the budget has been uh, forwarded to the county board is for lack of a better term once it's uh, getting ready for publication it's frozen you can't take action on it um, uh, until that uh, meeting where you're taking up the formal budget uh, amendment process and, and consideration process I don't know Corp Council if you have anything uh, to add um, no I was just going to emphasize what you just emphasized which is it's not that process is, isn't outlined in completely in state statute. It's actually set forth in your rules on how it goes to HR finance and, and then to the full board. Um, the statutes relate to, first of all, the apportionment deadline and then the publication requirements for when the budget is frozen for publication uh, and when it then comes back to you for review and amendment. Okay, we have Supervisor Hart. Oh, excuse me. I didn't hit Supervisor Van Cray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, wanted to make a comment on the alternative draft for consideration that Supervisor Baker provided to us. Just on that April uh, Committee of the Whole meeting and the changes, um, I don't know if anybody maybe at our next meeting could reflect on what they think the, the amount of time, so if we're proposing two two-hour meetings for us to go through all of this stuff together versus um, this stuff to be presented at the different committees, um, what we think that time commitment would be, uh, just because I don't know that I, I think I'd maybe rather spend two two-hour meetings here in this room than going back and watching seven different committee meetings for that information. But if anybody could provide you know, insight on what they thought that time commitment would be, that'd be great. 
in I'll, I'll you know it, it would require additional uh, potentially additional uh discussion uh, or additional staff time to pro provide the education directly to each of the committees i understand uh you know the, the supervisors uh, intent to have specific items discussed by each of the standing committees uh, the the premise was initially was to have an understanding of the full budget process and the distinctions between uh, you know funding sources and how dollars in a particular department may not reflect a dollar of tax levy because other other funding sources provide revenue sources to that the, uh, that department. Um, that being said, uh, you know the the hope was that each committee would take up those discussions uh, in its uh, deliberations on those. Uh, you know because it's uh, again getting back into mandated versus, uh, you know, uh, state mandated versus uh, county uh, preference, a lot of it is service level delivery uh, uh, what service level do you want is going to dictate the amount of budget that is going to be needed to deliver that service. In other words, if you want to have a service delivery of clearing the roads to a bare standard of by within 24 hours or within 12 hours or within six hours and have a uh, a PACER rating for highway of seven, that's going to require a level of support of this. So that's the kind of discussion that we were hoping that would happen at each of the committees. But uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the proposal would potentially require additional staff time uh, because I think you, you potentially might have uh, additional discussions. I'm not, I don't know, uh, I would have to uh, discuss it with uh, the administrator and see where uh, his presentations were, uh, the uh, potential uh, uh, finance committee chairs, uh, portions of the presentations, uh, and then uh, because that was being worked out. So next we have Supervisor Baker. Thank you, Chair Gibbs. I can definitely see that there are some items that may make sense to leave as a committee of the whole. You know, so I, I would not be adverse to having a hybrid, you know, having some of that done as the committee of the whole and having some also by standing committees. I do, I do want to, us to consider, you know, having multiples having on the agenda on multiple months in the standing committees to give us time to ask questions and to get response back. And then in, in response to Supervisor Hart's comments about the timeline, I tried to keep everything the same. Uh, obviously, if the administrator or corp council sees that I did something incorrect, you know, that I would obviously need to be corrected. I do have one, um, if we did adopt the November 7th meeting, I'm not sure if the November 6th and November 7th dates provide enough to get the agenda set. So that might be something that to look at if we were gonna do that. Because I I know that wouldn't give the clerk much time to get the agenda out in the legal manner. So thank you. The other the other comment that I, you know, I will just make is, you know, the the reason that the, the, it was set up for discussion and potential uh, discussion by it gave the supervisors two opportunities to bring amendments. First, it brought amendments while the finance committee had the uh, the budget. Once the finance committee uh, moves the budget to the full board, the full board also has opportunity to make amendments to the budget. So there's two opportunities um, as it's spelled out, uh, you know, here. Um, so uh, next we have Supervisor Dickinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I certainly appreciate the work you guys did in HR Finance because I was one of those people who had questions about, um, you know, what's mandated, what's discretionary levels of service and all of that. This gives us more opportunity, I think, to get into that. Uh, and there's a lot more time uh, ahead to, to make contributions. Um, I also appreciate uh, moving up the preliminary budget 
which last year it was October 12th and October 20th. Now it's September 26th. So that's a good two and a half to three and a half weeks for uh, for all of us to to get that information, to be able to uh, to make amendments and things as such. Um, the the one the one concern I have though is if we do get to that point where based upon what Super Baker Supervisor Baker had had shown, if we're not able if if HR Finance isn't accepting the amendments um, and and putting those into that budget, we're going to still get to the point at the end where we potentially have that four or five hour meeting um, because we don't know how many amendments are going to be there. So that last last year we went November 3, November 4, November 9, November 10. And this year we're 2, 6, 8, 9. So it's seven days for both starting from the public hearing. So we still have seven days from the public hearing. That's my concern. I would be interested in, in trying to find a way to put in maybe another meeting in there where we can have that discussion if these things come up. I don't think anybody thinks there's going to be 19 amendments, potential amendments this year. I, I would hope not for all of our sanity, but I understand it could happen. And, you know, honestly, it could happen next year with a new board um, who has, who is driven, you know, for, for certain things. So, so I'd make those comments. Um, there is one question I do have, and it has to do with the state statute. So there are as my understanding is, there are two state statutes that we are affected by. And one is the November 15th date, which applies to the clerk and her duties and the apportionment. The other is the 15 days after the pub, uh, 15 days to the public hearing. So when the budget is, is released, there's 15 days to the public hearing. Supervisor Robinson made a reference to a statute talking about the date of October 11th. And I'm trying to, I, I don't know what, it, what is that? Um, because if we only have the 15th, then really our work needs to be done by the 9th. And then if you get to that public hearing, how can, is there a possibility of moving that back slightly to allow for that time to have an additional discussion, additional meeting um, within that week, making that 10 days, if that makes sense. The, um, the, the October 11th date is predicated upon the hearing date. So that's that statutory separation. So if you moved it up, you could. If you move the public hearing up, you'd have to move that date up. You can adjust it. So you have to have, you have that separation. At least that's, you know, Christy, you need that publication and you need time to get it to the Herald to get it reviewed. Um, so we need some extra time in there, but it's basically to make sure that we have the adequate notice between the time that we finalize the numbers for the budget for the hearing and the notification of the hearing and that actual hearing. So you can, that, that September or that October 11th date was predicated upon a hearing on a date certain. If you move that hearing, you can move that date. So it isn't effectively 15 days between November, October 11th and November 2nd, but built into that is some staff time to pro provide additional time for staff to get the information to be published, to publish it, and, and to uh, the entities that need to publish it. Uh, that's, that's the additional time. So it looks like in the calendar it says 10-16. So that's, you're talking, so there's five days between 1011 and 1016 is for preparation. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, and, and it also complies with what our board rules say, what is, a, is the normal uh, uh, education date uh, of the board on a Thursday. Uh, Supervisor Shafinsky. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and again, thank you to everybody that's worked on this. I think this is a giant step forward. Uh, with regard to the, the proposal with HR Finance or the county board sitting as a committee of the whole, uh, from the standpoint of following state law and complying with, with our state law, could we change our rules to allow the administrator to forward the proposed budget to the board as a committee of the whole 
as opposed to HR finance. Would that be in compliance with state law? I believe it would, but I will research that for you and get you an answer just so I'm 100% sure. Thank you. Other discussion? Okay, we are down to item four from the executive committee. Uh, uh, updates to the Marathon County Strategic Plan, Resolution 16-23. Any discussion? Supervisor Van Cray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a note that on the version that is in our board packet, for 3.3, the items that say deemed complete afterwards, um, Health and Human Services Committee actually struck those from our edits. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit earlier about it, Chair Gibbs, that it's just kind of a formality to note that those are complete, but I will just note that we removed those. Um, and I think those were the only ones for us. Oh, and maybe 7.2. Thank you. Vice Chair McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as far as the strategic plan, um, I do want to thank um, all the committees, the chairs, um, the staff. Uh, I, I did not anticipate nine months of updating this. I, I, I'm glad that it was done uh, properly and thoroughly. Um, so uh, it, it, it there, if there's any, you know, tweaks or changes, um, that's that's that probably is going to happen. But like I said, I do want to thank the committees for all the time that they put into because this is now going to be our strategic plan. This board, the 2018-2022 strategic plan, was adopted by a different board. It's it's relatively the same, but things have changed since 2018. Um, and it's updated. So again, I just, um, like I said, I want to thank everybody, the entire board, um, for making these recommendations. So thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Supervisor Van Cray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I forgot that I also wanted just to make notes so everybody was aware that the executive committee did make changes to some of the um, changes that came from the committee. So I'd like to encourage everybody to go to the last executive committee packet and look at the document that was presented to executive committee. Those are the changes that the committees themselves made. This document is that updated document with changes that exec made to some of those changes. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, uh, we'll move on to announcements and or requests. Any announcements or requests? Um, have a couple of announcements. First uh, announcement, uh, had a request from uh, several supervisors to uh, look at possibly changing the start time of the county board meetings. Um, uh, we'll move that to exec uh, and have exec potentially move it to rules review um, and or if the exec feels that it's appropriate to have a discussion with the full board. Um, the uh, other announcement, the deputy county administrator, uh, Chris Holman, has uh, asked me to make an announcement to uh, offer to any board member who hasn't had a chance to see and tour the NCHC campus, uh, especially the social services section uh, and some of the renovations that uh, Please get in contact with uh, with uh, Mr. Holman, uh, the deputy administrator. Uh, he's going to be offering tours uh, on the dates of March 24th and March 31st at 11 o'clock. Uh, for those that sign up. Also, if those times do not work for you and you still wish to tour the campus, uh, by all means, reach out to uh, Mr. Holman on a one-to-one -one basis and he will try to accommodate uh, the ability to tour those facilities. With that, is there any other announcements? Okay, we are down to item number 11. What is your pleasure? Motion by Supervisor Rosenberg and second by uh, Supervisor Seafelt to adjourn. 
Okay, uh, I will recognize, and I apologize, uh, the motion was by Supervisor Vensky and is seconded by Supervisor Arsted. They used the, uh, the uh, meeting, uh, open meetings, and I will try to continue to utilize that. Thank you. Uh, any, any discussion? All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? And we stand adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.